guys. Griff Come Jenkins. join us on the couch. Lisa Marie Booth, as she's known on Twitter. Yes. I, we know her as Lisa yes. Booth. At, yes, at we know very her well name known. because of Twitter. It's true. You know, I think it was Lisa Booth was taken. Yep. But my, my name is Lisa Marie Booth, so that's Love it. That's, that's Lisa not Marie Booth news. on Twitter <laughs> is, very, is very popular, and she was tweeting about me line dancing on New Year's <laughs> Eve, for which hundreds of Twitter followers of hers want me to do that, which is not going to happen. I think, no. we, I think we signed ourselves up for something nope, that not uh, me. nobody not me. wants to see. It would be, it'd be <laughs> a ratings disaster. <laughs> yeah, email us at friends at, uh, at foxnews.com. But we have <laughs> news. We must get to dance. on this important Saturday right, morning. Go. Okay, Join sorry. us this entire four hours. we got a lot coming at you, including this. We'll start with... The president getting down to business at Camp David this weekend, despite all the noise surrounding a new tell-all book. The president, along with members of his cabinet and top congressional leaders, working on a busy legislative agenda. You Garrett, said leakers. I did, I did. <laughs> no, that would be different. Uh, because there could be. But, but fortunately, we'll Garrett Tinney is live in D.C. with the details, and he knows what's going on. Good morning, Garrett. Hey, good morning, y'all. GOP leaders are planning to cover a lot of ground during this retreat, including setting their legislative priorities for the coming year. You can see some of those meetings that took place yesterday in these picks, and we're told much of the discussion focused on the landscape for the 2018 midterm elections. Republicans are hoping to keep their majorities in both the House and the Senate and are expected to face some particularly tough battles to do so in the House. So leaders have suggested the midterms will certainly play a role in what their plans are over the next several months months. With that in mind, they also plan to focus on their successful passage of the GOP's tax bill, which the president talked about yesterday as he departed the White House for Camp David. Going over with the senators, we've set new records and I think they'll be continued to set. The tax cuts are really kicking in far beyond what anyone thought. And today, we're told the discussions will shift to a number of policy issues the GOP is hoping to tackle this year, including infrastructure, national security, tax policy, next year's budget, and DACA. The meetings will start with a working breakfast around 8.30 a.m. Eastern and then pick up again around 11 to talk more about their policy plans for the year ahead, including avoiding a government shutdown that's set to kick in January 19th if a new budget isn't passed. Back to you. A lot, a lot going on there. Thanks, Garrett. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. I mean, I think there's there's so much noise and we're going to get to the noise here in the program. Yeah. You've been hearing a lot about it. The main, so-called mainstream media is obsessing about it. I think there's a book. There might be there. a book. <laughs> it, it, we'll see. I'm, I'm Maybe hearing it came about out it. Yesterday. <laughs> but underneath it all is an administration laser focused on doubling down on the accomplishments they've already made and and a showdown with Democrats who want this DACA deal, who want amnesty for dreamers, but don't want to give anything for it, except they don't control any levers of power. So the question is, how does the, the government in power, this president, stare them down, get a wall, get an end to chain migration, get an end to the visa lottery system in exchange for a deal on DACA? And, and by the way, does the government shut down in the process? Washington hates that. The folks that voted for President Trump probably don't care if the government gets shut down. He's got to make that calculus, and he's got a chance to do some big things. Well, and President Trump has tweeted previously, no wall, no deal on DACA. And it's going to be interesting to see what did Democrats do, because they got a lot of heat for the fact that uh, Senator uh, Chuck Schumer caved on DACA because they really sure. wanted, uh, or immigration activists really wanted Chuck Schumer to hold the line, to not vote for a spending bill if it didn't include DACA. And he didn't because they didn't want to be responsible for a government shutdown. So did they do the same on January, uh, January 19th uh -huh. or, or what a Democrats Listen. do? And does President Trump hold the line and say, no deal on DACA unless I get uh, the wall? I'm the reporter usually doing Garrett Tinney's job for Fox and Friends all week long. <laughs> I want to talk about DACA infrastructure, the proposal by the administration, $18 billion over 10 years to build the wall. Whether we have a government shutdown, sure. that's important. But look, you cannot ignore this book. OK, this is a tell like book <laughs> that came out very early. And the president, who is clearly this book is about the gossiping and the infighting and the interesting sure. uh, uh, battles going on in the early uh, years of uh, months of this administration. But it's now coming on the heels of the tax reform, the biggest accomplishment in 31 years on tax reform in the president at Camp David now trying to move on these issues. But yet the president also is not going to let this go. Chris, can we can put I, can I ask you a question real yeah. quick? Okay, so on this book, do you think if something mm. as salacious, which we've had even reporters like uh, Maggie Haberman of the New York Times say that parts of it are disputed, um, do you think this would get the same amount of attention if the book was about President Obama? Well, listen, you know. Honestly. The honest answer, no, I don't. 
because the takeaway from this book is that it was the justification that the president's critics and those that truly hate him yeah. in the media, now they have it. They've Good got the, the smoking gun that proves that he is somehow uh, unfit. unfit. But Haberman and some others are saying that's really not there. Here's the thing, though. This book did... Uh, do what perhaps Michael Wolff, one of the intended uh, consequences, which is he knew President Trump would not let it go, particularly when the sales not... makes his disparaging remarks from his chief strategist, Steve Bannon, against him and his family. And this and is the tweet yeah. that I want to get to, uh, the new tweet today for our viewers to see. Michael Wolff is a total loser <laughs> who made up stories in order to sell this really boring and untruthful book. He used sloppy Steve Bannon, who cried when he got fired and begged for his job. Now, sloppy Steve has been dumped like a dog by almost everybody. Too bad. A little bit of news there, actually. I have not heard anywhere that uh, sloppy Steve, as he's now known, cried when he got fired. Well, and the left is, is sort of fawning over this because they want this palace intrigue. They want Steve Mann and, and President Trump <clears throat> shooting at each other. It, and it's amazing. I can't even believe I'm going to do this, but I'm going to cite the New York Times or the failing New York Times <laughs> as evidence. It pains the, you. It pains me <laughs> as evidence of the fact that maybe everything in this book isn't quite as true as you might think. This is Maggie Haberman, who's usually making things up about the president. Here's what she had to say about this book. Listen. He creates a narrative that is notionally true, um, the, the conceptually true. The details are often wrong, and I can I can see several places in the book that are wrong. He gets basic details wrong. He has a history of telling people they're off the record and disregarding them. Right. So the details are really important. Details are what quotes are made of, mm -hmm. are what phrases are made of, whether it's treasonous or, you know, dumb as a box of rocks or whatever phrases you want to use inside the book. If you're if you're misquoting someone, you're mischaracterizing the entire intention of, of that particular conversation. So well, what, what what can you believe? And, in this and book? a couple of things, too. I mean, in the book, it alleges that President Trump didn't know who um, former Speaker John Banner was. <laughs> Yet yep. back in 2013, they went golfing. So, of course, he knew who And he, he was. referred to him on the campaign trail multiple times. Well, and also, I've seen a couple people bring this up on Twitter, and it's a great point of which, which one is it? Is it President Trump, you know, as dumb as a box of rocks, didn't want to win, didn't think he was going to win? That's Ivanka, Or is he this way. treasonous, uh, you know, guy who's been colluding with uh, Russia yeah. and has, you know, smartly swayed the election b because of that? You know, I mean, so, like, which narrative is it? It's like the media can't decide. And I, I think when you have just basic facts... Uh, like the John Banner thing, wrong. You've got uh, reporters like the New York Times, which fundamentally hate President Trump. I yeah. mean, look at every article that has ever been published yeah. uh, in the New York Times yeah. saying that, look, this guy has a history of getting things wrong. There's parts in this that I, I know myself, Maggie Haberman, saying is wrong. And then how can you take the entire book at face value? But well, that's you know, what the media is doing. I'll tell you, Lisa, you raised perhaps the most important question Thank I've you. heard about this <laughs> book since it came <laughs> out. No, so no on, you, asked me, you asked me. You asked me. Would you like you to know, say would, would six, this have been taken the same way with us? Uh, had Maybe the book been <laughs> <right>. <laughs> about President Obama? But but if I turn your question just a little bit, and that is, had President Obama in his first year accomplished tax reform that hadn't been done in three decades, and these other things Anwar, that the president has done on mandate. his agenda, would he have gotten the 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 diss that he has gotten from the mainstream media, the lack of coverage. Yeah. And you know, Roger Stone, uh, an advisor long, early on, long time confident. talked about the agenda a little bit. L let me play this thought real quick. None of this is going to change anything. The Trump core constituency will remain strongly behind the president as long as he continues to keep faith with them on the platform that got him elected. We have a record stock market. We have unemployment at historic lows, a boom in the housing market, a solid conservative on the Supreme Court. Donald Trump's making America great again, and candidly, nobody really cares about what Steve Bannon thinks. You know, listen, I, I'm a fan of Steve Bannon. I think he's a smart guy. He's done a lot of great things. But the reality is, is it, this is not about Steve Bannon. This is about the country. This is about what President Trump is doing. And so if, if those two things come in conflict, then, of course, the voters that voted for President Trump are going to say, what is his agenda and how is he accomplishing it? And a tell-all book and giving access and, and, and one person's agenda isn't going, ever going to trump, to use a phrase, what this president is actually accomplishing. That is the bigger narrative, and that's exactly well, what Roger I, I Stone is saying. I also think that this, the intention is to not cover those things, and that's where the exactly. media's focus is, because they don't want to cover 
uh, you know, tax reform in 30 years, Anwar mm -hmm. in 40 years, uh, individual mandate. All right, but we, we've got to turn no, you're right. uh, to some more headlines. Uh, there's other stuff going on, I guess. So, <laughs> all right. Well, we begin with extreme weather. Millions across the country bracing for dangerous record bracing cold. We feel it even here. Sub zero wind chills expected from North Carolina to Maine. The powerful system already flooding streets in Massachusetts, cars paralyzed and under several feet of icy water. And in New Jersey, firefighters battling fierce winds fueling a house fire in Newark. The violent storm blamed for at least 12 deaths. Ah. Two planes colliding on the ground overnight, passengers panicking as they watch flames erupt from the wing of the other plane. Oh, oh, my oh me. Oh my gosh, look at that. And those passengers inside a WestJet flight that had just landed at Toronto's Pearson's International Airport from Cancun. The stationary plane struck by an empty sung wing aircraft moving back from the gate. Passengers evacuated by sliding down emergency slides. Thankfully, nobody was hurt. And one person is $450 million richer after a single jackpot winning Mega Millions ticket was sold in Florida. The winning numbers in Friday's drawing are 28, 30, 39, 59, 70, and Mega Ball 10. There's still no, <laughs> there's still no word who bought the ticket and where in Florida. I wish that was me. Sadly, I wonder it was if my, not. I wonder if my mom but, won. She's actually played. <laughs> well, 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 we'll see. I hope so. But there's still another <laughs> massive jackpot up for grabs. Tonight's Powerball drawing is at 750 million bucks. I'm looking at your mom, Griff Jenkins. 570. All right. Well, I mean, those, you may eventually headlines. move to 750 after no one wins. I played on Wednesday. I didn't win. But I talked to my 85-year-old mother in Florida, and she said, I'm going to play Mega Millions. So maybe she, she won. I love it. All right. I love well, it. Keep playing, folks. Griff, maybe think, you will uh, win. This is you. <laughs> All right. He was more. suspended for his botched report on the Russia investigation. Now Brian Ross is returning to ABC News, but with a demotion. The details coming up. Plus, the Russian collusion narrative and impeachment attempts, well, they're not working. So the left is trying a new talking point. The president, well, he's unstable. Should Americans be concerned about the president's mental fitness? None of this normal, none of this acceptable, none of this, frankly, stable. Thanks, Jake Tapper. Well, David Webb says this is destined to fail. He joins us next. Welcome back. Well, the left has pushed the Russian collusion narrative and talked about impeachment. But with neither working, the left, well, they have a new talking point. Should Americans be concerned about the president's mental fitness that he appears to be speaking so lightly about threats regarding the nuclear button? None of this normal, none of this acceptable, none of this, frankly, stable behavior. But isn't it remarkable that we're talking about the president's mental state and asking honest questions about his mental state. You also have members in Congress uh, meeting with psychiatrists to, to talk about the 25th Amendment. But will all this talk about the president's mental health actually backfire on Democrats? Fox News contributor David Webb joins us right now to react. I mean, I, I think okay. we just wind you up and let you go. <laughs> no, I mean, oh, the, the last part, Talking to psychiatrists about, first of all, no credible psychiatrist would ever issue something on a patient unless they've actually met with the patient. So it's ridiculous. This is about a narrative that the Democrats need. They failed on impeachment. It was a farce. It didn't fall under anything. There has to be a chargeable crime. They now need a narrative because they fear what's coming. They're watching all of these investigations, the resistance movement and everything, be both ineffective and unraveling. The unraveling of this whole mess around fusion GPS, the Mueller investigation, fruit of the poison tree, the term that le that's a legal uh, application of that. Was it the poison tree with the dossier? Who paid for it? Was it used as James Comey admitted that he gave it to his Columbia law professor friend and leaked it, which, by the way, is also a violation of law under federal code because those documents and anything, whether he did it on his laptop or not, are still within presidential privilege and they had, but not that permission wasn't given to him. That unravels Andrew McCabe, Weissman, you've got Lee, Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, and the big one in this, and I want Americans yeah. to pay attention, the coming name in this, Bruce and Nellie Orr. Bruce Orr, who resigned from DOJ, and his wife, Nellie, who worked for Fusion GPS. Add to that that something was very smart. Devin Nunes didn't give up his subpoena power. There was that false ethics charge. He sure. was cleared. That subpoena power mattered because then nobody, Republican, Democrat, or bureaucrat, could stop him from subpoena. Now we have the unredacted documents, and that's key 
not redacted, unredacted, which are due by the 11th of next week. But this whole, this whole narrative that the president is unfit, how insulting is that to voters of President Trump or those who see him as the disruptive leader that they want? Well, if he's unfit, then you voted. I mean, it's this whole, the, the left has to say, well, you're crazy, he's crazy, not maybe there's a strategy here. They're driving it to their base. The fact is that when you go to the, the rest of the country, the people that support President Trump are not going to buy that narrative. So who are they driving it to? They're driving it to an ever dwindling base. And we've watched the Democrat Party essentially not be a national party anymore. And some Democrats are concerned, but they're not in charge. Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, Keith Ellison, Tom Perez, the other... Antifa leaders. Keith Ellison? Yes, Antifa Keith Ellison, who holds up the Antifa manual as a way to resist fascism. I mean, these guys, they yeah, have nothing yeah. else. By the way, where's the bill they've presented? Where's their policy or quick, argument? Quick, quick prediction, we got to go. Yes or no, will this boost or hurt the president? All this talk about the uh, emperor has no clothes. It'll do nothing. It will do nothing to him because he's got a coordinated effort and a, and a strong base that supports him and success from tax policy. David Webb, thank you very much. And a Twitter account. Right. <laughs> David Webb, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Well, Joe Biden, he's fueling the 2020 rumors by slamming President Trump in a new interview. But is the former VP ignoring his own many questionable decisions? How history may haunt Uncle Joe next. Plus, want to watch us while you work out? One gym just decided to pull the plug on all cable news. Yep. Wait till you hear why. Well, that's rude. <laughs> Welcome back. A couple of quick headlines for you. Amid years of damaging leaks, NSA Director Admiral Mike Rogers is expected to retire within months. This is according to multiple reports. In an internal letter, Rogers told staff he'll be leaving in the spring. President Trump is expected to nominate his replacement this month. Stay on the lookout for that. And Democratic Congressman Earl Blumenauer is boycotting President Trump's nice bow tie. First ever State of the Union address, the outspoken anti-Trump resistor representative from Oregon, who did not, of course, attend Trump's inauguration, says instead of being at the address, he'll be working at home. The address is slated for January 30th. Griff, down to you. Pete, thank you. Former Vice President Joe Biden back in the spotlight and slamming President Trump. What I worry about is about fundamental miscalculations. This is not a business deal. CEOs uh, saying we're going to grow, we're going to raise wages. And they are saying we're so glad not to have new regulations added on. Did your administration go too far? Those same CEOs in a much larger um, uh, and deeper poll that was done also have grave doubt about his judgment. His criticism fueling speculation that he's all in on a 2020 presidential run, but is Biden ignoring his own questionable decisions while in office? Here to debate it, the president of Security Studies, Jim Hansen, and president of Washington Strategy Group, Joel Rubin. Gentlemen, good morning. How are you? Uh, Jim, let's start with you to react to Vice President uh, Biden. Last time I checked, he's not in control, but he certainly has a lot of advice to our armchair offer. What are your thoughts? You know, I would like to jump on board the Joe Biden 2020 bandwagon right now. I wholeheartedly <laughs> support crazy Uncle Joe getting in the ring. He's got nothing but bad decisions and bad policies in his uh, background. And I, I think the only thing that could be better for Republicans and the only better way to guarantee Trump's win would be for Hillary to run again. But I'm afraid she might have to get a work release from her federal prison where her uh, email and Clinton Foundation corruption scam are catching up for her. So we'll settle for Joe. Okay, Jim, let me hold the politics for one second. Joel, I want you to respond because you're a former Deputy Secretary of State. What is it that President Biden and, and uh, President Obama and Vice President Biden did, you know, that would have been uh, a better uh, response to what's happening right now with clearly an escalated rhetoric from the rogue regime in North Korea? Well, well, it, it's great to see a, a strong leader coming back to Washington who has real bipartisan credibility and leadership shocks. And uh, Vice President Biden, his popularity is sky high. It's 57 percent. Americans like him. They like what he's done on veterans, his fight against cancer. And on North Korea, to your question, uh, frankly, he is making a clear point that uh, we should be tough on North Korea, have aggressive sanctions and diplomacy, but not be threatening nuclear war, not be trying to create 
community dynamic where we make an unhinged leader more unhinged, as we've seen over the past year, where North Korea has made more progress in the last year on its program than it did in the previous decade. So uh, it's good to have someone back in Washington who can really speak for a broad sector of America. Real quick, Jim, let me respond to that. Uh, let you respond to that because Joel is saying that this whole tweet from President Trump about the button and the tit tat with uh, Kim Jong Un is it bringing us, as Vice President Biden says, uh, closer to nuclear war? Uh, last time I checked, the North Koreans called South Korea and opened a diplomatic hotline hours after that happened that they hadn't been using. I think President Trump's bringing him to the table. You know, I mean, Joe Biden was wrong about Iraq. He was for the Iraq war, then against the surge, which helped us win it. Then he helped President Obama cut and run from Iraq, which opened the vacuum that ISIS and Iran moved into. He helped bring the Iran deal into effect sent pallets of cash to the Iranian government, which they're now using to buy bullets to shoot the protesters again after he and Obama ignored the 2009 Green Revolution there. He hasn't got any foreign policy success to stand on. Uh -huh. So I think running against him would be a, a godsend to the Republican well, Party. Let me tell you what else you can't ignore, uh, Jim. And Joel, I want you to respond to this. Howard Dean saying that Joe Biden's just simply too old to run. Well, I'm not going to judge whether he's too old or not. He's about the same age as President Trump. So if that's the case, then neither should really be contemplating running in 2020. But in terms of his foreign policy acumen, uh, the fight against ISIS that we're winning was a fight that was structured and organized by Joe Biden as vice president. <laughs> and and, and uh, the Iran nuclear agreement, which has prevented Iran verifiably from getting a nuclear <laughs> weapon, was as a result of tough negotiations and sanctions led by the administration, the Obama administration administration that the Trump administration is potentially going to unravel and leave us exposed to an Iranian nuclear program without constraints. So I wouldn't right. exactly say that uh, those are failures. All right, Joel Rubin, thank you very much. Jim Hansen, thank you for taking time. I guess we'll find out whether or not Vice President uh, Biden was correct when he said he could take uh, Howard Dean. We'll leave that for another day. Thanks for joining us, guys. Pleasure, thank you. Griff. All right. Remember when Defense Secretary James Mattis said this? What keeps you awake at night? Nothing. I keep other people awake at night. Wait until you hear Mad Dog's newest message for our enemies. In the first congressional calls for a criminal investigation into the author of that anti-Trump dossier, former Congressman Jason Chaffetz has called that dossier bogus from the beginning. He is here next. Stop the leaks, give us the documents, answer our questions. Attorney General Sessions, I asked him in the, in the witness, uh, when he was witness in the Judiciary Committee, I asked him, I said, look, did you pay Christopher Steele? Did you pay the author of the dossier, the person that Senator Grassley and, and, and Senator Graham are talking about today? Did the FBI pay him at the same time the Clinton campaign was paying him? And we need a second special counsel. Even Lindsey Graham and a host of members are calling for that second special counsel to examine all this. So those are the four key points. If there's movement on those, fine. That's what I hope happens. But if there's is not, then there should be a new attorney general. Uh, that was Jim Jordan on the channel previously. We're going to bring in Jason Chaffetz, Fox News contributor and a former colleague of Jim Jordan as well. So you heard that sound, Congressman. He also joined in an op-ed with Mark Meadows, basically saying, you know, it's time for a new attorney general. He's not doing enough. What's your take on uh, uh, I, I, Unfortunately, and I've said this before, I do think it is time for the attorney general to go. He has recused himself of some of the most important issues that are going on at the Department of Justice. Uh, there are major systemic problems within the Department of Justice. Uh, you, you, Jim Jordan was right. I think Mark Meadows is right. Now you have Chris Stewart of, out of Utah, who's also on the Intel Committee. You have judiciary members that are frustrated that the attorney general is not answering basic questions. Mm -hmm. I, I just think he's in over his head. And you don't need all these special counsels if you have a, an attorney general who can actually do his job. And I don't see Attorney General Sessions is able to do the basic requirements of what he was hired to do. Even well, staying, staying on um, the Department of Justice, so now they're looking into potential pay to play with the Clinton Foundation. You've raised concerns all the way back in 2015 over Uranium One. From your perspective and what you've seen as the former chairman of Oversight Committee, what should they be looking at and what do you hope that they drill down on? Yeah, it was back in June of, uh, of 2015 with Ron DeSantis, who was my subcommittee chairman, 
uh, we sent a seven-page letter l outlining the details and the companies that we had uh, serious uh, transactional issues with. This went to Jack Lew, who was uh, at the time the Treasury Secretary. We sent it to the Department of Defense. Uh, uranium is critical to what we're doing with our nuclear arsenal. Um, and, and, you know, you, in part, you could chalk it up to, all right, the deep state and maybe... Maybe it's the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. But finally, I'm just glad now, if these reports are true, that the Department of Justice is finally starting to look at this and, you know, peel it back. But it's taken so, so, years so, so, to get to it, that point. Is it beyond Uranium One, or, or are you yes. specifically very concerned about Well, Uranium, Uranium One is one of the factors, but we list out in this letter several of the companies and organizations and questioning the flow of money. And at the surface, the, for those that aren't as familiar with this, we have a very finite resource in uranium. Why would our government, why is it in the best interest of the United States to allow anybody other than the United States access to that uranium? And now we find out that not only was it involved with Canada, but going to Asia and to Europe. Hey, hey, hang on, though. Let me ask you, though, because there's all these calls for Sessions to, to step down, to replace him. But at the same time, you have, as you just said in a minute, this long overdue and a formal investigation into Hillary Clinton. They're looking at the pay-for-play scheme with the Clinton Foundation. They're looking at yeah. the emails, what emails, you know, right, ended right. up uh, where. And, and so there's movement on that. But now we have, and my question to you is, how significant is this that the Department of Justice is unveiling the Trump dossier, ultimately possibly giving the public view a look at what may have been the motivation and impetus for the entire Mueller investigation to begin with. Again, I don't understand, particularly under a Trump administration, why when the when the chairman of the Intel Committee, Devin Nunes, Trey Gowdy, uh, Tom Rooney, um, all these people are wanting this document, they issue a subpoena in August. They shouldn't have to negotiate anything in my book, but now they're finally getting it. It took the Speaker of the House to sit down with the senior people of the Department of Justice saying, you have to give us this. And remember, on the Clinton email scandal, that was supposedly a closed case. Sure. Mm -hmm. So there's yeah. no excuse for not turning over information when it's a closed case. Well, the big issue, though, is going to be the Inspector General. Michael Horowitz, yep. it doesn't get talked about because he doesn't leak things. He has 450 employees at the Department of Justice looking under the hood. And by the time we get to the end of March, I think you'll have a report. That will be, I think, the single most definitive What's in that report. Absolutely. What's under the hood? Yeah. What's under the Well, it, look, he's independent. He was an Obama appointee. Uh, Trey Gowdy and myself have spent years working with him. We believe in him. We trust him. And I think he will do a very Probably thorough, incredible job. That we'll get. And, and yeah. what a novel concept, not leaking the contents <laughs> of an investigation. <laughs> I didn't know that was stick, possible these the new days. The new high bar, like, <laughs> oh, my gosh, you're actually doing your job. <laughs> One last question. So two prominent senators, uh, Chuck Grassley and Lindsey Graham, yes. have referred criminal uh, a request for criminal investigation or prosecution into the author of the dossier, Christopher Steele. What might they know? What are they... What do they have to know in order to make this kind of recommendation? It's, it's a pretty big, pretty big news. So if you have concerns in Congress, you maybe send a letter, you maybe talk to the legislative liaison. Then you can ratchet up a little bit, maybe send a subpoena. When you get to the point when you actually make a criminal referral, then you're saying to the Department of Justice, we have seen the information, we have seen the evidence, we believe there is more than a probable cause to prosecute this crime. And so that is a whole nother level, and you've got... You know, attorneys, uh, you know, and a, a very seasoned attorney in Lindsey Graham, you got the chairman of the Judiciary Care, uh, Committee, uh, Chuck Grassley, and they've seen classified information that none of us have seen. Mm -hmm. That's a whole nother level. Well, it's two very guys are rare. Not actually. known as just partisan it's, bomb throwers. I mean, right. that's the ultimate power of these committees, it, it, it's, though. It's, it's very stuff. rare to do that, and it should be a signal that they've seen a lot of information that yeah. is yet to come out. Interesting. We'll see where it goes. All right. Congress, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're turning now to a few additional headlines. The U.S. putting Iran's regime on notice during an emergency U.N. Security Council meeting over the country's crackdown on protests. Several people are dead after a week of violent demonstrations, fueled in part by unhappiness over the country's economy, with the price of basic necessities like food skyrocketing. The price of freedom also quite high in the Islamic Republic of Iran as well. U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley says the regime must stop trying to silence protesters. Of the Iranian people should be heard. It is a spontaneous expression of fundamental human rights. Well, the Iranian ambassador to the U.N. claims the issue falls outside the scope of U.S. control. 
Plus, ABC News' is Brian Ross, well, he's returning to work on Monday, but with a different job, you know, just shuffling him around. The chief investigative correspondent was handled, handed a four-week unpaid suspension last month after this Fox report on Mike Flynn. He's prepared to testify that President Trump, as a candidate, Donald Trump, ordered him, directed him to make contact with the Russians, which contradicts all that Donald Trump has said at this point. Ross will now work at ABC News outside production house to work on long-term projects. It's kind of like, where's my stapler? Uh, he will keep his title as a chief investigative correspondent, but will no longer be seen on ABC with live reports. That's a demotion. And a national fitness chain now banning cable news networks from its gym TV screens. Lifetime Fitness, of which I am a member, posting on Twitter the decision to pull 24-hour cable news on all of its 128 locations because the, quote, consistently negative or politically charged content doesn't mesh with the company's, quote, healthy way of life philosophy. The gym says member requests were also a factor. I noticed this when I was in the elliptical the other day. It's maddening. <laughs> now the gym's got to be a safe space, too. Finally, Secretary of Defense James Mattis is known for his tough-talking leadership, so it's no surprise to hear him say this to a room full of reporters at the Pentagon. What's your biggest military concern for this year? Um, I don't think I have any. I don't have concerns I create. <laughs> that is outstanding. Uh -huh. This isn't his first time instilling fear into America's enemies. Listen. What keeps you awake at night? Nothing. I keep other people awake at night. A walking quote. Mattis tells reporters the Pentagon will release its national defense strategy later this month. And those, uh, that was quite a grab bag of headlines. Maybe you should have uh, Defense Secretary Mattis talk to Lifetime Fitness and straighten out that cable. Oh, they would do whatever exactly. he says. Exactly. Black out. Yeah, and then they Listen, would have nightmares about every it. Every time I went in, you got CNN, you got MSNBC, you got Fox News Channel. You can work out wherever you want, watch whatever you want. Do you think Apparently they saw you working out and then that. made that policy? Maybe. I, I like <laughs> to trigger kidding. people whenever I can. <laughs> All right, we're moving on. The illegal immigrant acquitted of murder, murdering Kate Steinle, just got saved by the courts again. The son of our next guest was also killed by an illegal alien. He joins us to react to the sentence next. And it's happening again. An ESPN host attacking President Trump and not mincing her words. Uh, her punishment, well, it'll have you crying foul. But Trump always does this in his thing, so... What's they... he's a f That's because he's oh, a f stupid person. <laughs>